It's been a long time. Hey guys, Pete here. Just a little over eight years ago, the final episode of the eighth season of Dexter aired as a series finale. Now the character's been reborn in a limited series called Dexter New Blood, and this will be my breakdown of the first episode. It was a promising reintroduction to the Bay Harbor Butcher, whose circumstances have changed quite a bit in a decade of hiding. It's been 10 years of abstinence where he isn't killing anyone, not even people who would be fair game according to the code, although we aren't sure how many of those he might have encountered since he's not actively looking for them. He may be on the straight and narrow in that regard, but he's still the same character at his core, and as you'd imagine, things get complicated. We'll get into all of that after a quick spoiler warning. If you haven't watched episode 1 yet, then this video won't be for you. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. New Blood's first episode is titled Cold Snap, and most of the episode is dedicated to introducing us to the new setting, the new characters, and setting the table for the upcoming season. We find Dexter Morgan in December 2021. He's left Miami. He spent at least some time up there in Oregon where we last saw him at the end of season 8. He's living in the small town of Iron Lake, New York, and has taken on the fake name Jim Lindsay. This is a nod to the Dexter book series author Jeff Lindsay. He seems to have settled into an unassuming small town existence. He works at a fish and game store. He's in what appears to be a healthy relationship with the chief of police. He's got some land and some livestock that he looks after. And he's got a routine. That involves stalking an albino buck in the woods near his cabin. And he does carry a rifle with him when he does this, but it doesn't seem like he has any intention of killing the majestic animal. It's like they have a connection, and you can see the symbolism of its rarity. He lives outside of town alone, but his dead sister Deb has replaced his dead adoptive father Harry as that voice that he talks to inside of his head. It's that thing that acts as his conscience that as viewers we see as a manifestation. The role she plays for him doesn't seem to be the same as Harry's who acted as a guide in relation to the code. Deb seems more like a partner or support system in this period of time where he's trying not to kill anyone. On the way into town, we meet his girlfriend, Angela, who pulls him over in a role-playing kind of situation that gets hot until it gets interrupted. There's a call about runaway sheep eating a neighbor's winter plantings, and there's no other officers available, so they have to take a rain check. As he walks through town, we get the idea that Jim is well-known and seems to be liked by everyone he encounters. And we also find out through Ramon, as a helicopter flies overhead, that outsiders come to the town at this time of year. He's still the donut guy at work, or at least the sweet roll guy, and he's still Switzerland when it comes to weighing in on disputes. And again, it seems like he has a good rapport with his boss. A character named Matt Codwell comes into the store to purchase a knife and gun. He wants something impressive looking that'll outdo what his friend Bill is hunting with, and he's unambiguously unlikable all around. He's loud, entitled, he claims his dad is someone important in town, and he's got a high paying job in finance, which all adds up to him carrying himself as if he owns the place. And all of that together seems to be particularly grating for Dexter as Matt's trying to convince him to overlook the background check and just let him have this gun. Dex plays by the book, he doesn't give in, and because there's no secrets in Iron Lake, the story of the background check comes up as soon as he walks into the police station to see Angela. The woman who was working dispatch, Esther, asks him about it and offers up that she thinks it's probably related to the boat accident that happened back in Ohio. Apparently five people died, and you can see Dexter's radar going off when he hears this. Deputy Logan stands up for Matt, saying that he's a good guy, that he wasn't even driving, and that he was in the hospital for weeks. He's sure it was only a really tragic accident, and goes so far as to say that he bets Matt's record would be spotless. Until he looks and sees that, okay, there are a few spots, and again, you can see that Dexter's getting noticeably uncomfortable, and eventually changes the subject. In her office, Angela has a board filled with missing young girls, and she just came out of a meeting where she tells Dex that there's no bodies, no pattern, and there's no funding until one of them turns up dead. 
So it looks like these girls have been going missing for some time, but there's no evidence that they were killed or what happened to them. That night, Dexter and Angela go line dancing. It seems like that's what everyone in town does. And we get a little more acquainted with the people, and we get a little bit more from Matt as he tries to get the rifle again, and he invites Dexter to a party. There's a cut to a different scene where we see a rig pulling up to a Caldwell truck stop that's about two miles away from Iron Lake, and we see a mysterious figure get out. Then as Dexter's leaving the tavern, we see that same person watching him. And again, during his morning routine the next morning, the person's there, makes a noise and scares the deer away. So he's starting to feel like someone's watching him and he's right. There's a protest outside the tavern because the oil billionaire is inside and using it for his board meeting, which is a problem for Dexter who can't enjoy his tuna fish salad for lunch. Angela's daughter's there and she catches his attention whenever she dumps out this cup of cocoa that he gave the crowd and it earns her a stern look from the billionaire. It's one of those shots where the camera lingers so you can't miss it. The background check finally goes through and Fred Jr. tells Dexter to deliver the gun to him. He goes inside, there's a party raging, Bill takes him upstairs, they find out that Matt's busy, he's having sex with a young woman, and while they're waiting, Bill tells him he needs a straightener, and goes in the bathroom to start snorting lines. He brought the girl to the party, so he's distraught, and as he's getting high, he starts to open up to Dexter. Eventually, and somewhat out of the blue, he confesses that he covered for Matt on the boat, that Matt's father paid him to lie at the trial, and when Dexter pushes a little, he finds out that they were playing chicken and that the other guy actually yielded. He gave up, but Matt crashed into him anyway because he didn't like him. And this is exactly the kind of thing Dex needs to fit him into his code. As he's handing the gun off, we see that he's really starting to think about this when he has a vision of smashing him in the face, but ultimately leaves without incident. When he arrives back at his cabin, he sees a light turn on inside and he grabs a hatchet before sneaking in the side door. Inside, he finds his son Harrison, who's now grown, looking through his desk. He asks him point blank if he's Dexter Morgan, and before he can answer, Deb appears to him warning him not to tell the truth. You can't. Everyone close to you dies. That's why we're here. And he does decide to lie. It's difficult, but Deb persists to the point of pulling a bullet out of her stomach to make the point. He doubles down even though Harrison knows he's his father and just offers him some money for the bus out of town the next night, promising that he won't say anything about him breaking into the cabin. After he goes, he finds a picture of them together and he watches him walk away through the window. Deb tells him he did the right thing and that Harrison will be safer with Hannah. And then we see Dexter burn the photo in the fire outside. He has a nightmare where he sees Deb on his ice fishing line where he's reeling it in and she's grabbed by a dark figure and pulled under the water. When he wakes up, she tells him that she's glad that she went first and that she loves him for making it 10 years without a kill. The next morning, while he's stalking the deer, he's able to approach it. And just as he's reaching his hand out and having a moment with the animal, a shot rings out and it goes down. Matt runs up because of course he shot it. And this time, Jim follows through with the idea of knocking him out with the butt of his rifle. In probably the best sequence of the entire episode, he makes the decision to kill Matt. And the voiceover internal dialogue comes back saying, it's been a long time. He puts the deer out of its misery and then prepares a makeshift kill room for Matt. He notices there's some blood coming from the back of his head and says out loud, sorry about the mess, I'm out of practice. He puts together a couple pieces of broken glass as a blood slide and in the process Matt wakes up. Aside from the impromptu feeling of the kill room, Dex quickly falls back into his old routine. He wants Matt to tell him what he did, he wants him to own it, and when he says or, there's a funny callback to him waving the knife around inside the fish and game store. After a back and forth, he gets him to cop to it, and then Matt shifts to trying to blame it all on bad parenting as he begs for his life. This makes him think about his own childhood, and how he wouldn't have had any direction if it wasn't for Harry. And in that moment, the seeds are planted for him to go after Harrison. He tells Matt that they passed the point of no return and things shift where Matt tries to threaten him. He says, my dad knows everyone in this town and he will find you and rain down a world of pain, which is enough for Dex to move on to silencing him. We hear him say, tonight's the night. Hello, Dexter Morgan. 
It feels just like old times. But then he gets a phone call from Angela. They were supposed to get together, so he lies about why he can't make it. And then when he gets off the phone, he says he doesn't need trophies anymore. And that he may be a monster, but he's an evolving monster. And then he moves on to dismembering the body. Then we see him head to his truck. Deb pops up to ask him what he's doing, and he says not listening to you. And in the voiceover, we hear him talking about how his life has always been truth adjacent, but starting now, there will be one less lie. He goes to the bus station and gives Harrison a winter jacket before telling him that he was right. I'm Dexter Morgan, your father. And he asks him to come home. As he's bringing him back to the cabin, we hear him think about how he's going to take care of his son. The same way Harry took care of him. And we get the sense that he's worried that if there's no one there for Harrison, he may turn out just like Dexter. As they go inside, we notice that there's blood on the snow outside the cabin. There's a trail of it. It's probably from that wound in the back of Matt's head. And the episode ends there with the familiar blood theme playing over the closing credits. So yeah, I thought it was a pretty solid start. The deer was an interesting in to show who he is now. The stalking without a kill at the end, the rarity of it being albino and his assumed connection to that, it all makes you wonder how long it took for that to become part of his everyday routine. Overall, I'm buying his lifestyle. It mostly seems like a good fit for the version of Dexter who's trying not to indulge his dark passenger. It doesn't seem off for him to live this kind of life. Although even before Matt was dropped in his lap, it looked like there was doubt that he could keep it up. I really liked how they stressed that it's a small community where there are no secrets except the glaring one that we know about. Just that prolific serial killer that never got caught hanging out and going line dancing with the chief of police. I thought the way that they held off on it and then reintroduced the voiceover, waiting that far into the episode was really effective. It felt like something was missing and it made it all the more meaningful when it kicked in. Deb had a great introduction, even though we knew she was coming, it was still a great surprise. And it did appear that she was an effective coping mechanism right up to the point where he killed again. Given that this is his conscience, it's not really Deb, but it does distinctly have her personality. It'll be really fun to watch that internal struggle as he tries not to continue killing, especially now that Harrison is in the picture. The sex scene between Angela and Dex was pretty effective for developing their relationship. It makes it seem like they've been together for a while, but they're keeping things exciting. It also works to show that they make time for each other, since it seems like they made the decision to have them not sleep at each other's places. She's got a daughter, and they need to have him off alone so they can maximize the Deb scenes. The whole Matt situation was convenient and predictable. For me, it was the least exciting part of it. But the end result of Jim going full Dexter is what's really important, I guess. You can make a safe assumption that his father will be throwing resources at trying to find him now that he's missing. And he seems to have sway on everyone in town, according to the character description. Plus, we saw his name on the truck stop, which means that he is definitely a public figure. Obviously, there's something big brewing with the missing girls. That would hint that there's someone who's going to be more interesting to Dexter than Matt was. There's also some little details here that might come up again later. The stolen pies that Logan recovered, the protest and that look from Ed Olson, and of course the girl that Angela helped out at the bar. I think it did what it needed to do. It set things up, and I'm interested to see where things go from here. Really curious to find out how Harrison ended up there in the first place, and how Dexter is going to explain the whole faking his death thing. And that seems like a pretty good place to leave things. Let me know in the comments what you thought of the first episode, where you think things are going, what are you hoping to see. Please like this video if you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. And thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.